Thanks, Steve. And as people are getting settled in, I'm going to kick off this lightning round to talk about tree pests and damage. And I want to start by saying thank you to the many people that uh, contributed to the work. I'm going to focus mostly on aerial forest damage detection surveys, but I will be presenting a little information on some of the other monitoring efforts we're involved with. The aerial detection survey method's pretty simple. There's two people in the back of a plane. We cover, fly over the state every year at least once. And when you're going 100 miles an hour, it's everything you can see and sketch onto a topographic map, and we try to attribute it with uh, what we think it is. There's a lot of factors that affect the results of our aerial detection surveys, but we do find it to be a very helpful tool. It's a great tool for looking at the landscape, a very useful tool for recording what we see, and for communicating what we see. But um, when the VMC staff said, hey, we'd like you to have a chapter on this in our annual report, my, I was pretty skeptical. Uh, because I analyzed this, I was pretty skeptical. Can we really do that? But thanks to a lot of help from Jim Duncan and Jen Pontius, I do have some trends to report on. Uh, we have maps that go back to the 1960s. The data since 1985 is archived in the VMC database. I'm going to be talking about just the last 20 years. Over the last 20 years, we've recorded dozens of different kinds of forest damage. But if we threw them all together and looked at from year to year, what, how much damage do we map every year? Um, you notice that there's, it goes up and down a little bit, but it's pretty uh, in the same range except for one outlier, and that was 1998 when we had the ice storm. When you look at just the mortality, our most severe kinds of things that we map are the mortality and the tree dieback, so the ones that indicate the most um, severe damage to the forest. Uh, we map less of those than anything else. Those are the red and the black lines on this graph, and the good news is that we don't map much of them every year. But in, over this 20-year period, it's in the last 10 years, the, the amount of those two things has really decreased considerably. And that's consistent with a really ample a growing season precipitation we've had in the last 10 years compared to the previous 10 years. And uh, I just want you to look at that particular time frame, this four-year period in here, and compare it to the results from the ground from the VMC forest health monitoring plots. And I'm just looking again at the dieback symptoms on those ground plots. And again, this will be in the annual report, but looking at the amount of dieback that was in, observed on those trees over a variety of species in the same time frame, you can see there was also an increase in the amount of dieback. We looked at just a couple of specific declines, uh, hardwood decline and beech bark disease caused by, uh, that's initiated by a non-native insect. And those two had that increase in dieback uh, in intensity and extent over that time period. Foliage symptoms, they are pretty easy to see from the air. They generally reflect less uh, severe damage to the trees or more temporary damage to the trees. Uh, we, the amount we map from year to year fluctuates. This is the discoloration and defoliation that we mapped from year to year. We looked at several specific sources of foliage damage, drought damage. Anthracnose, that's caused by fungus diseases that are more severe during uh, moist years. Forest tent caterpillar defoliation and this insect outbreaks tend to uh, occur more frequently starting from dry periods and birch defoliators, and there's quite a few different agents that are responsible for the first birch defoliation, so we map it in all different kinds of years. And every dog has its day. They, differ, they have different peaks over the last 20 years, but they do explain the different peaks that we've had and the amount of defoliation that we've mapped. Uh, Frost explains the peak that these other ones didn't explain. And again, weather is a pretty major driver of the amount that we're seeing. So pat in terms of patterns, we see damage every year, and we have lots of different damage agents we're looking at. Weather's a major driver. Um, the most critical symptoms are worse after the dry years. And basically, what we see on the ground mirrors what we're seeing from the air. Um, there's nothing really surprising there. So let's have a little more fun with it, looking at all these dozens of damage agents that we've mapped over the last 20 years. 
What if we were to look at each one of those damage agents and how often did we see it over the last 20 years and compare it to the maximum footprint? How extensive was it in the year when it was most extensive? And Jim helped put together this nice little graph. So over in the lower left-hand corner in the blue circle, those are the really minor agents. We only saw them a couple times in 20 years and they didn't cover much area. And in the lower right, those are the, the more chronic d damages, the ones that we see frequently, sometimes some of them every year, they still don't cover that much area. And up in the upper left, those are the episodic damage agents, the ones that cover a pretty big area, but we don't see them very often. What we didn't see is anything that occurred over a really extensive area and occurred very frequently. And we're lucky in Vermont, there's some regions of the country that are getting that kind of damage. If you think of the bark beetle epidemics out west. But that's not to say there's no problems at all. I'm just going to point at a couple of things that we see in the data that are, are kind of red flags. Um, the birch defoliators, we map them every year. They don't cover a very wide area. But in terms of Vermont, the birch forest type doesn't cover a very wide area either. So um, about half the years of the last 20 years, uh, we mapped over 10% of the birch forest type as having birch defoliation. And you'd think that would be having impact on birch health. Another red flag, uh, the beech bark disease. Again, it's something we map every year. And it, it, it covers a significant area, if not a whole lot. Um, and every place that we're mapping beech bark disease, we have beech trees that are dying. And when those beech trees are dying, what's happening? The young beech regeneration is being allowed to outcompete the other trees that are also in the understory. It's something our foresters are seeing. And it's something that's reflected in the FIA data, looking at the advanced regeneration. The amount of beech really is the species that um, predominates all across the state, and it's increasing. So lessons learned, um, we're not seeing disturbances that affect a lot of Vermont's forest land every year. There's no ecosystem collapse going on here, um, but we are documenting significant impacts on some of the species. Lesson I learned, um, yes, you can analyze these data. <laughs> and, um, and there's probably a lot of information we, there, that's yet to be discovered in the maps we haven't archived yet. So that's the view from the air and uh, enjoy the rest of your day and I guess we're going down to the ground next. <laughs>